Glad you guys are here. I was wondering, you know, about five of ten, if anybody was coming, but you all came at the last minute. That's wonderful. Glad you're here. It's a cold morning, but um, good to be together in God's spirit. I think we're all hungry for some sense of community in our lives these days, and uh, First Congregational is a great place to find that, to reconnect with people week by week here. And we just heard one of my favorite uh, Bible texts from the Old Testament, uh, from Isaiah. Um, and it's a great one for as, uh, as we're entering into this new year, the first part of January. And it's also a good one because I want you to think for a moment about what is something that you fear in life? What is it something that you um, have a phobia of or have a, a apprehension about or kind of scared of? What is something, something in your life that you're afraid of? Just think about that for a second. I can tell you what I'm afraid of. Uh, confession time here, so I've never said this before, but I'm afraid of the water. I'm afraid of going in the I love being near the water, like on the shore or walking along the beach, but not going in the water. I don't like going in the water. And I'll tell you why. When I was in second grade, uh, we went to swimming lessons as part of school. It wasn't separate from school, it was in school. We'd get on a bus, I don't know, once or twice a week, uh, and we go to this uh, community swimming pool and get out. It was freezing, of course. And you go in there and you put your swimsuit on and they give you one of these little belts with the floaty thing on the back and you go in uh, by the pool. And the first day we did this, um, we were standing along the pool and you, uh, there was an instructor there, a young guy who was, who was leading the class and he said, to everybody in the pool. And the kids get in the pool. I didn't want to get in the pool because it's, who knows how deep that is? I can't touch the bottom. I don't know. I can't swim. So I'm not getting in the pool. I don't want to get in the pool. He says, you got to get in the pool. You got to, I'm not getting in the pool. And we were back, I'm, not, I'm not going. I, I, I'm not getting in there. You got to get in the pool. So we're back and forth like this. And he's getting upset. Finally, he picks me up and throws me in the pool. Just like that. And I'm splashing around in the pool. I was freaking out because I had this little floaty thing on, but that was just pitching me forward into the, into the water, my head under. Uh, so I was losing it. Um, but then there was another instructor who was in the pool, and they came along and put their hand on my chest and lifted my head up out of the water. And then I was, oh, well, I wasn't okay, but I mean, <laughs> I was better <laughs> and able to get to the side of the pool. Um, and, and, and finish the class. Uh, but it was a f terrifying experience. Uh, the class actually, the, the instructor, after an unpleasant visit from my parents, um, <laughs> I don't know what they talked about, but he was kind of friendly to me after that. <laughs> uh, uh, it was okay. But I never got over that, uh, that experience of being uh, helpless in the water like that for, for a bit. Uh, so I still, to this day, I'm afraid of the water, which is why, one of the reasons why, I love the text that Ann just read, because part of that text uh, reads like this, when you pass through the waters, I will be with you, and through the rivers, they shall not overwhelm you, because that's how I felt. I felt like I was being overwhelmed, and that hand came and lifted my, my head up. So as we look ahead to this new year. We don't know what the new year holds, but I do know this. There's going to be some really good things that are going to happen in 2022. Some great things are going to happen in 2022. But there's also some, some challenging things that are going to happen too, some things that you'd rather not face. Maybe some of your fears or phobias or things that you're anxious about, you come, they come right to you. Remember this text when that happens, when those things happen. Remember that no matter the challenging times, God's hand is going to come right up on you and lift your head up so that you're going to be okay. You're going to get through those times and be able to hang on all the more to the good times as well. When you pass through the waters, I will be with you. And through the rivers, they shall not overwhelm you. We'll catch up next week. It's on and off rain today, uh, so we're going to send you to evangelize Dunkin' Donuts, I guess, afterwards today, uh, if you don't mind, or Starbucks, or Biddy and Bo's, or your church.
choice. You've got a lot of choices for that. So coffee hour will, uh, we, we're not going to move it inside uh, because of COVID and the need to take masks down to eat and drink. So um, uh, we'll just hopefully be able to ha have that outside next uh, Sunday. After worship today, confirmation class, uh, which got underway last Sunday with uh, our orient, uh, orientation meeting, uh, will be continuing here in the sanctuary directly following the service today. We'll be meeting right here. And the Board of Deacons uh, will be meeting on Tuesday at 7.30. Uh, and we'll start promptly at 7.30 in the narthex. Uh, that way it's easier to heat that space than the lounge, which we have been using, that opens to the sanctuary. So we'll be meeting in the narthex and see how that space works out for us. Right now, uh, as we sing the doxology, I do encourage you to think about your giving to the church as we uh, progress into this new year and the good things that uh, we will be able to accomplish in this uh, uh, 2022 uh, in the light of God's light and the ministry of Christ in this place that is made tangible by your giving. Your offering is invited. We are on a roll with some of my favorite texts from the scripture. Uh, the one I'm about to read here, the opening of John's Gospel, is my probably my favorite uh, New Testament text. And it reads like this. In the beginning was the Word, and the Word was with God, and the Word was God. He was in the beginning with God. All things came into being through him, and without him not one thing came into being. What has come into being in him was life, and the life was the light of all people. The light shines in the darkness, and the darkness did not overcome it. There was a man sent from God whose name was John. He came as a witness to testify to the light so that all might believe through him. He himself was not the light, but he came to testify to the light. The true light, which enlightens everyone, was coming into the world. He was in the world, and the world came into being through him, yet the world did not know him. Here ends our scripture lessons for this morning. May God add a blessing to the reading and to the hearing of these holy words. Will you pray with me? Compassionate creator, may the words of my mouth and the meditations of our minds and our hearts bring us into deeper relationship with you, you who are our strength and our redeemer. Amen. Well, as many of you know, the Christmas story as we know it is built around the accounts in the Bible found in the gospel of, Gospels of Matthew and Luke. Mark, Gospel of Mark, doesn't even pretend to talk about the origins of Jesus. It just opens with uh, his baptism as an adult. But John, John's Gospel, John does talk about the origins of Jesus, but his Christmas story, let's call it that, is not anything like Matthew and Luke's. In John, there is no angel Gabriel. There is no Joseph or Mary. There is no Bethlehem. There's no Magi. John's gospel begins, and for him the life of Jesus begins, kind of like the month of January, when everything was a fresh start. It begins before creation itself had any baggage. In fact, John begins the story of Jesus before creation itself. There was no earth, there was no wind, there was no water. The only thing that existed was the Word. Now, the Word is not referring to the Bible. Some people get that mixed up because the Bible is often referred to as the Word of God, but that's not what John is talking about here. In John's Christmas story, the word is taken from Greek philosophy. The word is logos, logos, meaning, meaning uh, the principle, the, the desire, the presence of order in the universe. In other words, God. John also pulls from Proverbs 8 here, which talks about the origins 
of the spirit of wisdom, or Sophia. She says, the Lord created me at the beginning of his work, the first of his acts of long ago. Ages ago I was set up at the first, before the beginning of the earth. So some echoes there of John 1. So for John, at the very beginning of everything, there was order, there was goodness, there was wisdom. But this word, this logos, didn't just sit there. It is active. It created the universe. It created our world within the universe. In other words, the world didn't just happen. It was intentionally created. But something went awry. John says, darkness crept into God's world, upsetting the goodness and order and purpose of things. Now, I know there are some problematic aspects to John's language here because he uses light to equal good and darkness to equal bad and evil, and the racial overtones of that don't work at all, of course, but I prefer to read this language not as referring to color uh, at all, really, but as the word, as the logos, and, the, and that which, is oppo- that which uh, opposes the word uh, and logos. Maybe here it is good and evil or, or, or daytime and nighttime, but when it comes to good and evil, what's interesting is that we sometimes look to the Bible for answers about why. Why is there evil in the world? And John is no help here. He, because he seems to be at a loss, too. This darkness is, is a mystery in God's creation. It just shows up out of nowhere. Kind of like COVID-19. It turns things in the wrong direction and, and brings death and destruction. John doesn't say where it comes from. It's just there. But we don't need to know its origins to recognize it. And strangely enough, strangely enough, people gravitate to it. They gravitate to that darkness. In fact, in John chapter 3, he writes, The light has come into the world, and people loved darkness rather than light. And later, John summarizes the, the, the evil of Judas's betrayal of Jesus with one quick, simple phrase, and then it was night. This darkness isn't just evident in the Bible. It's also evident in our world today. It's ironic that January 6th is now not just remembered as Epiphany itself, Epiphany Day, but it's also the anniversary of the terrorist attack on our capital one year ago. Darkness broke through then to desecrate and attack the freedoms we hold so dear. This pandemic, this pandemic has laid waste to so many lives and careers and hopes and dreams. The natural order of the logos is interrupted by Alzheimer's and cancer and fires and earthquakes. We cannot help but see the darkness that John is talking about. We even see it in ourselves. Our tempers and our prejudices and our our unacknowledged weaknesses. We see it in the way that the church stands on the sidelines of things, wringing its hands at the hopelessness of this world. Yes, we know what John is talking about. You know, I think this sermon is starting to sound like a downer, and I didn't mean it that way. I mean, I'm preaching it, and I feel that way. I can only imagine how it sounds to you, but most of you know me, and you know I'm relentlessly optimistic, and the reason that this is my favorite text from the New Testament is because of John's affirmation here. It's an affirmation that you really can't feel deep down in your bones unless you look at the darkness square on and not turn away. John knew the darkness and cruelty of this world, and yet he says, the light 
shines in the darkness, and the darkness did not overcome it. The light shines in the darkness, and the darkness did not overcome it. I want you to note something really important here, and it has to do with the grammar of this sentence. The light shines in the darkness. That's present tense. And then it switches. And the darkness did not overcome it. That's past tense. In other words, the darkness has already tried and failed. Tried and failed to overcome the light. The light has already won. The reason this is so powerful is that the light doesn't shine in spite of the darkness. It is the darkness that lingers around despite the victory of the light. That means that the darkness has not only already lost, it will always lose. The darkness has no means of winning. And that's not just wishful thinking as we start the new year. It is a statement of faith. And like any statement of faith, it is both an assurance and a calling. We are assured that the light, the word, the logos, the personified presence of God in Jesus Christ has and will be greater than any darkness. And at the same time, we are charged with carrying that light into the places where darkness threatens to hold sway. Because there are places where the darkness that John is talking about has a tight grip through sickness, despair, and hatred, and separation. But you remember what Jesus called us? He called his followers children of the light. We are those who carry God's light into those places of darkness in order to bring healing and grace and peace. And we don't have to guess about how to do that. We don't have to try and figure that out because Jesus goes ahead of us to show us the way. So, do you know what's coming in this new year? Will we get our act together as a country, as a world? Will we get the better of COVID-19? Will the church embody its mission? Or will old problems barge into our our January optimism? The truth is, we don't know. But what we do know, and what I can proclaim to you with absolute certainty, is that light has come into this world and the darkness did not overcome it. The darkness has already lost. And you know what's coming in this new year? More light. More light is coming in this new year. What we do with that is up to us. But it is coming. It's coming in great shafts to pierce the darkness that remains. And as people of faith, we have the opportunity to grab on to that light and direct it into the, into the darkest corners of our, our politics and our health care and our own pessimism. So here, the truth of John's version of the Christmas story one more time. His affirmation that is at the core of what it means to be a Christian person. The light shines in the darkness, and the darkness did not overcome it. Let us pray. A holy and abundant God, help us to let go of our apprehensions about this new year, about the state of the world, about the state of ourselves. Help us to know, really know, that your light has already triumphed over the darkness of this world. And because of that, we know how this story comes out. Your love and your wholeness and your peace we'll have the last word. Through this time of prayer, may your light fill the lives of those who are struggling right now and give them peace and courage. 
by your Holy Spirit, bless the life of this church. May we continue to grow in faith and in good works now and in the days ahead. We pray in the name and spirit of the Word made flesh, Jesus the living Christ. Amen.